Before and after. Before and after. We are inundated with those snapshots of before and after. The way it was before and the way it is now after. Before and after pictures. You, you get them in the mail on postcards and flyers. They're in newspapers, magazines. They're all over social media. They come to you on television. We are constantly approached with snap, snapshots of something before and something after. Here was your hair before. We should have had a picture of Ed McDowell up here. Here was your picture of your hair before. Here's your picture now. Mine's getting that way too, Ed. So Here it is after. Or how about your teeth? Here was your teeth before. Here's after you've had them bleached. Or how about your roof on your house? Here was the roof on your house before it was spray washed. Here's the roof on your house after it was spray washed. We are bombarded by before and after pictures. And one of the most magnificent advertisements that use the before and after technique was a large scale ad campaign that was produced, that was put out by partnership for a drug free America. I believe it's still one of the best commercials ever on television. Launched in 1987, they used three different commercials but with the, the, the same exact announcement and there was also a related poster campaign that was in every magazine, every newspaper, all over the place. But it, it, it went like this and I've kind of got a picture here for you. You might remember it if you were around in 1987. It ran for quite a few years. The announcer would hold up an egg. And he would say, this is your brain. And he would hold up a frying pan that was already frying with hot grease, and he'd say, this is drugs. So you got the picture? This is your brain. This is drugs. And he would crack the egg, throw it in the pan, and you know what happened. That egg sizzled and fried almost immediately as the hot grease hit it. And the announcer would say, this is your brain on what? Drugs. This is your brain before drugs. This is your brain after drugs. I thought it was one of the greatest before and after pictures we've ever known. This is before. This is after. And the announcer would often say, either get the picture or is there any questions? Before and after, the Word of God promotes that same formula that there is a before and an after when we take up the study of the science of redemption. There is a before and after. They are often called 400 years of silence. The 400 silent years. At the close of the Old Testament, the Old Testament ends with the book of Malachi. And so at the close of the book of Malachi in the Old Testament, the nation of Israel is back again in the land of Palestine after the Babylonian captivity had come to an end. But they are under the, domin the domination of the great world power we call Persia. In Jerusalem, the temple has been Restored, been rebuilt, albeit a much smaller and nowhere near the glorious spectacle that Solomon had created years before. It's a much smaller building than the one Solomon had built and decorated uh, much less glorious. The descendants of Aaron have taken up their priestly activities again. There wasn't really a king 
They were a puppet nation in that day. Nevertheless, Jerusalem and its temple were functioning again. Jewish life had returned to Judea by the time Malachi is the prophet. But biblically speaking, there is now an interruption, a break. Malachi serves as prophet around 400 B.C. Then the silent years. Of course, silent does not mean nothing was happening. Things were taking place during those 400 years between the prophet Malachi and the first prophet of the New Testament. We know that during the 400 years of silence, we know that Alexander the Great would come and take over the world, would defeat Persia. And now Greece is the great empire of planet Earth. Judea would be ruled by the Greek empire. And then after the days of Alexander the Great, after he dies and his kingdom after a few years is divided up into four, and these four, these four kingdoms uh, from uh, Macedonia, Syria, Egypt, and Asia, these four nations now are the kingdoms of the world. And two of them would rule over Judea during these 400 years of silence. Judea was ruled by Egypt from Alexandria. Judea was also ruled by Syria during these 400 years of silence. So it went back and forth. And then the Maccabean Revolt, and the Jews would enjoy, to some degree, under the Hasmokinan uh, dynasty, named after the man who started it, during the last half of those 400 years, uh, Judea, Jerusalem, would enjoy uh, a, a semi-autonomous relationship. They would have some self-rule for almost 100 years. And then, of course, Rome would come along, and in 65 B.C., through the New Testament era, era Rome would rule, rule Judea. So, yes, 400 silent years, no prophet, no prophetic word during all that time, no prophets speak, no prophets write. Seems as if God allows the Old Testament to just seep in for a while, percolate. Those silent years stretched from when Malachi died in the Old Testament to a new prophet at the beginning of the New Testament era. And who was the very first prophet to come along for the very first time in over 400 years? It had been 400 years since there had been a prophet. His, he was nicknamed the Baptist. You know, apart from Jesus Christ, John the Baptist is the most theologically significant figure in the Gospels. Only Jesus Christ is more significant. As was the case with Jesus, Scripture meticulously recorded His birth, a divine intervention, an angelic proclamation, John's birth not only parallels that of Jesus, but it seems to also echo the momentous occasion of the birth of Isaac to Abraham and Sarah, this, this promise. John the Baptist is clearly a pivotal figure in the plan of salvation, although his formative years were lived in obscurity. He lived in a secluded area. His, his public ministry ended 400 years of silence. Isaiah 43, 40 verse 3, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make straight the desert, a highway for our God. Isaiah provided the voice of John 700 years before he was born. 700 years before he was born, Isaiah predicted that there would be an Elijah figure. He was truly a transitional figure forming the link between the Old and the New Testaments. Luke 
728. Jesus said, For I say to you, among those born of women, there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist, but he who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. So, so here we have Luke recording what Jesus said, Malachi, then there was a break for 400 years of silence. Then comes John the Baptist. John and Jesus, do you know John and Jesus, they first met when they were very, 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 very young. Very young. Luke 1, 39 through 41. Now Mary, who has just found out that she's pregnant with the Messiah, now Mary arose in those days and went into the hill country with haste to a city of Judah and entered the house of Zacharias and greeted, we believe, her aunt, Elizabeth. And it happened when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary that the babe, and who is she carrying? John the Baptist. And it happened when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary that the babe, John the Baptist, leaped in her womb and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit, while still a fetus, the Baptist leaped for joy when the Messiah came into the room, came into his presence. In fact, Dr. Luke is so impressed with this experience, he even mentions it twice in verse 44. Luke writes, For indeed, as, as the voice of your greeting, Elizabeth says, sounded in my ears, the babe leaped in my womb for joy. Jesus and John, first time they meet, fetus to fetus, womb to womb. John jumped when the Holy Spirit gave him the recognition of the presence of the Messiah starting to grow and grow in Mary. John would prepare the way for the Messiah. And in this sense, his ministry marked the culmination of the laws and the prophets and also heralded the invasion of the kingdom of God by its Messiah. The Messiah is invading planet Earth. His call for his listeners, repent, because the kingdom of heaven was near and it galvanized Judea. It was the central theme of his ministry, Matthew 3, 2, and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven in the form of a Messiah is here. He was straightforward in his summons to all to turn from sin and selfishness because eternity looms before us all. And the preacher there on Jordan's bank would use sometimes the, the strongest language, wouldn't he? In fact, I believe the strongest word used in the entire New Testament, John uses it. He says in Luke 3, 7, Then he said to the multitudes that came out to be baptized by him, Brood of vipers! You ever, ever call anybody that? I, I, I haven't done that one. Who warns you to flee from the wrath to come? By the way, Jesus would borrow it from John a year and a half later and also use that phrase. Jesus would come to see John. The word quarantine has taken on a new significance on our planet Earth as we deal with a pandemic. And, and John, the forerunner of Jesus, had grown and studied in what we might call semi-quarantine. Private, secluded, but his theme of change before and after. His, his preaching of before and after. And after caught the attention of all of Palestine. In fact, he was, he was attracting more listeners to the Jordan River than the Pharisees and the leaders of the Judean uh, religion were getting at their services. And he was nicknamed the Baptist. Why? Because his practice was to baptize those who responded to his message of change. Before... And after, Matthew 
3, 1 and 2. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. John's lifestyle was as stern as his message. This was a life of abstinence that you and I might not hardly understand. Living in the wilderness, he, he, he was clothed with camel's hair. His technique. Jesus would not use this technique. John's technique was different than what Jesus would use. Jesus would be an itinerant preacher, itinerant teacher, traveling from place to place and town to town, city to city, village to village, and mingling with the people from place to place. Is that what John did? No. John never moved. He started preaching at the Jordan. There he stayed. He didn't go from town to town. He expected you to come to him. And they did. In massive crowds, even though he was not a crowd pleaser, he drew crowds. He willingly confronted hypocrisy that he saw in the religious establishment. He also did not hesitate to expose the immorality of political leaders like Herod, for instance. All of these characteristics portray John as a fiery prophet proclaiming the apocalyptic message of God. In fact, Luke would write, Luke 1, 17, He will also go before him, he, John the Baptist, in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. And we see in Luke's words the connection to your Old Testament where we find in that very last book of the Old Testament the words of the prophet who wrote it, the man Malachi, and his very last words, very last words of the Old Testament, very last words of Malachi, what are his last words? Behold, Malachi 4, 5, and 6. I will send you who? You wonder where Luke got that from? I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, and he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. Luke stole the prophecy. When he looked at John the Baptist, he saw this prophecy from Malachi. He said, that's the guy. That's the guy who's coming as Elijah. And the Jews, they were, as an entire nation, anticipating an Elijah-type figure to come right before the coming of the, of the Messiah. That some type of an Elijah would come, and then the Christ. Elijah, then Jesus. Some Elijah facsimile, and then the Messiah. They were expecting that. Just like Elijah on Mount Carmel, John preached change. He preached this before and after snapshot. Elijah, during the showdown on Mount Carmel, here's what he had to say. So Ahab sent for all the children of Israel, and gathered the prophets together on Mount Carmel. Verse 21, And Elijah came to all the people and said, How long? How long will you falter between before and after? Between two opinions. If the Lord is God, follow Him. But if Baal, all right, follow Him. But the people answered him, not a word. And we see in John this same approach. He challenges his listeners to consider what would happen in the future. Now, his preaching centered on the Lamb of God. He really did not raise the question, when is the end of the world? But rather, what should we do right now? There's a before and an after. 
His words of judgment were aimed at the Jewish nation community that, to be perfectly honest, they were out of touch with the truth, out of touch with God. The Jews were in the dark. They, they were in this self-imposed darkness. And John the Baptist was sent to light the way. Open up their eyes. A messenger that led his listeners to examine their personal involvement and attachment to the world. The Jewish Roman historian Flavius Josephus, he would comment in his writings about John the Baptist. Here's what he said. AD 94 in his book Antiquities of the Jews, he, meaning John the Baptist, John the Baptist commanded the Jews to exercise virtue, both as to righteousness towards one another and piety towards God. Many came in large crowds, for they were greatly moved by the hearing of His words, and they came into the waters of Jordan for baptism. And we have a record of what is one of the most remarkable scenes on planet Earth. It had been prophesied in Daniel chapter 9, 70 weeks, the Messiah will show up and he will be anointed or baptized. And so we have this remarkable scene. It took place in the autumn of A.D. 27. John the Baptist had been drawing larger and larger and larger, still larger crowds over the last six months. In fact, when Jesus heard in his carpenter shop in Nazareth the news of a man named John, nicknamed the Baptist, and that he was preaching and baptizing at the Jordan, Jesus knew. Jesus knew. Jesus laid down the tools of his trade when he heard the news of John at the Jordan. It's time to go. Time had been fulfilled. Jesus knew. When he gets the news of John baptizing at the Jordan, Jesus lays down his tools. Jesus travels to the territory of Perea beyond the Jordan River, never to pick up his tools of carpentry ever again. Though Jesus and John were blood-related. We began to believe Elizabeth was the aunt to Mary, so Mary was Elizabeth's niece. And so though Jesus and John were blood-related, they were not at all directly acquainted. In fact, the only time they had ever met was when one was in Mary's womb and one was in Elizabeth's womb. That's the only time that the two had ever crossed paths. They had never seen each other other than that occasion. And, of course, their vision wasn't too good at that point. They had never met. Now, John the Baptist, of course, as he grew up into manhood, he certainly heard the stories circulating in Palestine concerning the birth of Jesus, for that was a well-known event. But their paths had never crossed. That is, until this event that all three, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, all report, Jesus arrives. He mingles with the crowd listening to John. The crowd that day, like crowds had been going there and hearing for the last six months, they hear John say, there's a time to make a change. It's now. This is what you were before. This is what you need to be after. And, of course, he promoted the idea of being baptized. And it is at that moment that Jesus steps forward. But now as John and Jesus come face to face, the Baptist, by the power of the Holy Spirit, he's blindsided by a sense of the perfection of the one who stands in front of him. And when Jesus says, John, I want you to baptize me, 
John the Baptist trembles at the very thought. No, no, absolutely not. It would be inappropriate. Uh, in fact, it would be downright sacrilegious for me, a sinner, to baptize someone as perfect as you. And so John balks at the idea. No, I, I can't. It's obvious that John did not fully grasp the fact that Jesus was to set a pattern for every sinner saved by grace. Every sinner saved by grace. And Jesus must actually plead with John. Please, John. I need you to do this for me. I understand your hesitancy, but please, John. Please, will you baptize me? And John ceases to resist. And John the Baptist baptizes the Savior of the world. A Savior who came to rescue a planet, a planet on death row. Are we not? Death row. Matthew tells us that it happened this way. Matthew 3, 13 through 15. Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. And John tried to prevent him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and are you coming to me? But Jesus answered and said to him, Permit it to be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he, John the Baptist, allowed him. The traditional spot, Deborah and I stood at the traditional spot where Jesus was baptized, wow, two years ago, almost to the day that we were there in Palestine. Um, I'm taking this picture from a, uh, a grandstand area uh, looking down at the Jordan River. This grandstand area had been built in 2000 to accommodate Pope John Paul II and his entourage who came to this spot in 2000, and they've kept the grandstands there. So as I take this picture, I'm standing on top of, uh, of the grandstand. In fact, I see Robin and Don, and, and Don Davis in the picture right here. Uh, now, none of us are in white down below that were traveling with us. All those in white, what are they getting ready to do? They're getting ready to be baptized in the Jordan River at the very spot that Jesus was baptized. And this spot has a lot of authenticity going for it. You know, sometimes spots, you, well, you wonder if this is really it. But this does fit perfectly the biblical narrative of being at Bethany beyond the Jordan, not the Bethany south of Jerusalem, but the Bethany beyond Jordan. That's exactly where this spot is at. Plus, if you can kind of see in the distance, uh, looks like maybe an old torn up building on the other side of the Jordan. Well, that's what it is. It's an ancient Byzantine church that had been built there around 500 A.D. to mark the spot where Jesus was baptized. And every Byzantine church that was built by Constantine, his mother Helena, and those that came after them from 300 over the next couple of hundred years, from 300 A.D. to 500 A.D., everywhere a Byzantine church was built, we are pretty certain Jacob's well, the nativity, these different places, we're pretty certain that this is indeed authentic spots. And so it is believed by everyone that this is where Jesus was baptized here at the Jordan River. Baptism. Baptism. It represents a picture of before and after. It is a decisive, pivotal moment in the life. Je Jesus would say this in Mark 16, 16. He who believes and is what? Baptized will be what? Say, wow. That's a pretty strong statement, isn't it? 
The intimacy of the believer's relationship with Christ is revealed. We, we hear those biblical expressions uh, like uh, baptized into Christ Jesus or baptized into His death or, or buried with Him in baptism. In, bad, in baptism like nothing else. We can enter into the passion experience of our Lord. Romans, Paul explains this in Romans 6, 3, and 4. Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus, were baptized into His death? Therefore, we were buried with Him through baptism and death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness after, before and after, before the old, after, Paul says, in newness. Before and after. Baptism is a picture of the greatest before and after of your life. Before, oldness of life. After, newness of life. Why don't people get baptized? You know, it's... They go one or two ways. Now, we're going to be very straight. Half of those who say, I'm not going to be baptized, they say, I'm not good enough to be baptized. They might not come right out and say it, but that's, I'm just so sinful. When I get good enough, I'll be baptized. Let me tell you, that's a fatal miscalculation. Fatal miscalculation to say, I'm not good enough to be baptized. You'll never be good enough to be baptized with that train of thought. So half the population that says we're not going to be baptized, they don't get baptized. Why? Because they're not good enough. The other half. The other half who say I'm not going to be baptized, they don't get baptized. Why? Because they're too good to be baptized. Now again, they may not come right out and say that. But you might hear things like, ah, Church is just full of hypocrites. I don't need to belong to that. It's not necessary. Jesus knows my heart. In other words, I'm too good to be baptized. When it all boils down, whatever reasons you might hear, those are it. I'm not good enough or I'm too good. Not necessary for me to be baptized. Baptism. Before and after baptism. John 3, 5. Jesus is talking to Nicodemus. Jesus answered, Most assuredly I say to you, Nicodemus, unless one is born of what? Water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Jesus was not very obtuse on this occasion, was he? This is crystal clear. Nicodemus. If you're not baptized by water and the Spirit, you don't get in. Is baptism that serious? Jesus said this. No parable, just straight talk. You either get baptized, Nicodemus, by water and the Spirit, otherwise... Now, maybe Nicodemus was special, that you and I are not like Nicodemus? I don't think there is a more critical before and after snapshot in the world. Before baptism, after baptism. Before baptism, the oldness of life. After baptism, the newness of life. Are you a before or an after? Real easy to know. Jesus, he went so far as to be baptized himself so that he just didn't tell us what we needed to do. He also showed us what he wanted us to do. 
Will there be people who say no to Jesus? Ah, I'm not good enough. Ah, I don't need it. Jesus knows my heart. You know, there's that, those initials. What are they? W, WWJD, right? What would Jesus do? What would, what would Jesus do? If he were here today, what would Jesus do? We do not even need to know. We don't have to ask the question when it comes to the topic of baptism. What would Jesus do? He did it. He was baptized by water and then the dove and the Holy Spirit. He was anointed. And Jesus tells John the Baptist, this is so serious and unless you're, not, unless you're baptized with water and the Holy Spirit, unless you go into the baptism, into the water, there's no before and after. Hmm. Powerful words. You know, last Sabbath, we spoke just a little bit of how much do we look like Jesus. And, and I illustrated if Jesus was standing here and I'm standing here and we took a snapshot, would I resemble him? Would I look like Jesus or do I just have a, a trait or two that reminds you of Jesus? Do, if you want to look like Jesus and you haven't been, be baptized. And then you'll look like Jesus, won't you? Was Jesus baptized? If you're going to look like Jesus... Boy, this is as easy as two plus two, isn't it? I don't even need to preach this, right? Jesus told us baptism is the pivotal point of before and after. Old man of sin before baptism. Newness of life after baptism. Now, of course, baptism does not guarantee salvation but it is sure very very dangerous to not take part of it in your life and, and, and such an easy process to look like Jesus be baptized how easy is that or are you not good enough those of you watching live stream are you not good enough or are you too good to be baptized. That if you are of certain age that you can believe and understand what excuse do we want to share because we're not going to be baptized. I hope none of us want to miss out. I hope we, pun intended, take the plunge. Take the plunge. Be baptized. Look like Jesus. Look like Christ. Baptism. The cleansing wave of Christ's blood symbolically supplied by the water of baptism. Evidently, there, there's nothing magical about the water. Nothing magical about the person who's, who's plunging you into the water. But evidently, Jesus Christ, through the power of the Holy Spirit, does something on that occasion that He does not do otherwise. It's that critical. Jesus answered, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water, reborn, in baptism of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. I hope we will all. If you have not, come to me. We can solve that problem. You can be baptized. Don't feel that you've got to be worthy. Don't feel that you're not good enough. And certainly don't feel that you're too good. Either is a fatal miscalculation. If you live a long ways from here and you're watching us on live stream, I encourage you to go to your nearest Seventh-day Adventist church and talk to a pastor. 
I guarantee you he'll be glad to talk to you about getting baptized because he knows this first. He knows what Jesus said. He knows how important it is to be baptized. And Doug, what a wonderful experience it is. Amen? Amen. Unless one is born of water and the Spirit. Our closing song talks about the cleansing wave the cleansing wave of the blood of Jesus, which is represented in the cleansing of the waters of baptism and that enlightened of the Holy Spirit upon each of us. Oh, now I see the cleansing wave. If you have not been baptized and you are of the age that you can believe and understand, whether you're sitting here today or watching on live stream and live in the area, come to me. And you can look just like Jesus and be baptized. Stand and let's sing our closing song, Cleansing Way. For those of you at home, it's hymn number 332. The Cleansing Way. Before I have our closing prayer, I need these seven individuals to meet with me just right here in front of the sanctuary after the congregation uh, leaves, the, uh, leaves our sanctuary. If, if you seven will just stay by and let me talk to you, I believe all seven of you are here. Neil Harden, Ken Mull, Janet Harden, Sam Hauser, Billy Hudson, Ed Robinson, and Gail Sperlin. If you will meet with me just for a couple of minutes after the congregation exits, all right? Let's pray. Loving Father, we have looked at a topic today, the topic of baptism. We 
realize that John the Baptist was this pivotal character that came on the scene after 400 years of silence. And his message was to repent and be baptized. And then Jesus, he lays down his carpentry tools. When he knows that time has been fulfilled, the 70 weeks have been fulfilled, it's time for the Messiah to be anointed. He goes to the Jordan. And there John baptizes Jesus so that we have this unbelievable pattern. That Jesus said, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, how are you going to enter the kingdom of God, Nicodemus? Same words are for us. Baptism. So easy and yet so pivotal. Before baptism. After baptism. Before. By the power of the Holy Spirit. Before baptism. We are lost and after we have this wonderful realization of a newness of life. We thank you for this wonderful ritual that you bless with the power of your Holy Spirit. May those who have heard me today, Father, or watch this tape later, may they realize the importance that they do not say they're too good or they're too bad but they accept the idea of looking like Jesus and choose to be baptized. Thank you for our Sabbath day. In Jesus' name, amen.